Well, um, it is, it's literally the oldest trick in the book. Uh, Adam and Eve, you know, fashioned by the hand of God, animated by the breath of God, living in the garden God created, enjoying the um, unadulterated intimacy of relationship with God and with each other until... Uh, they foolishly bought the lie of the tempter, right? Uh, the lie that the lie that God could not be trusted. That was the essence of the lie. Um, you know, He's holding out on you. Uh, he wants to He wants to hold you down. He wants to hold you back. He wants to narrow your life. He wants to constrict your life. He wants to confine your life. He wants to suck the joy or at least the pleasure out of your life. He's, he's keeping the good life from you. That was the lie. And they bought it, sadly. Um, hook, line, and sinker. They, they bought it. And, and we, we, meaning humanity at large, we have bought it and bought it and bought it. And sometimes I personally have bought the lie and sometimes you have bought the lie and and oftentimes we uh, we buy it because we've been seduced into thinking that uh, the the good life um, consists of uh, you know just like cheap thrills right or maybe even expensive <laughs> thrills um, and, and temporary fixes and it's all about now it's all about newer, faster, bigger, shinier, sexier, but, but before long, um, we have the experience that's so common, and that is the, just seeing it slip through our fingers like sand, and we find that the good life, as we've defined it, the good life as we've uh, come to understand it, maybe isn't so good after all, at least not for long. Today we're, we're wrapping up this series, this current series that we've been um, doing together and learning from some of the teachings of Jesus. And what we've been learning, I hope, I think, uh, what I've been learning is, uh, again, that God has no desire, God has no intention whatsoever of narrowing or constricting or confining our lives, but just the opposite is true. In fact, that God desperately, desperately wants to give us life that's truly life. God, you know, Jesus used the words, I want to give you life abundant, life to the full, or as we've been calling it during these weeks, the, the even better life. And it is. Um, <clears throat> it is a life that's new and shiny, <laughs> Um, appropriately understood. It's a, it's a life that's new from the inside out by the transforming work of God's grace. Jesus really wants to give us a new life, a life that's new by his transforming grace and a life that's shiny, if you will, with the unfading light of God's love and God's glory and God's goodness reflecting in and through our lives. And so to help us probe, you know, yet, a little more deeply into this new and shiny life, Jesus wades in um, uh, to yet another area of our lives, that uh, an area in which we tend to be easily seduced and easily deceived. Uh, it's recorded in the first book of the New Testament. We're returning there again this morning, the gospel according to Matthew chapter 6. And this morning, just for kind of a fresh perspective on this, I thought we might read from Eugene Peterson's uh, contemporary English paraphrase of the New Testament uh, called The Message. Um, it, look at it with me. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 and following. It, Jesus says, Don't hoard treasure down here where it gets eaten by moths and corroded by rust or, or worse, stolen by burglars. Anybody ever had anything stolen? Yeah, some of you have. Yeah, you, you know this, uh, you, you know this reality of what Jesus is talking about, right? So don't, don't hoard treasure down here where it gets eaten by moths, corroded by rust, or worse, stolen by 
burglars, stockpile treasure in heaven. And of course, if we read that thoughtfully, we have to stop and think, what's that look like? How do you do that, right? How do I put my money in the bank of heaven or whatever? How do I, how do I stockpile treasure in heaven? Well, it, of course, it has to begin with a little bit of redefinition, doesn't it? What, what is treasure? What's truly treasure? A stockpile treasure in heaven where it's safe from moth and rust and burglars. It, it, it's obvious, isn't it? The place where your treasure is is the place you will most want to be and end up being. The, the New International Version, you know, that, we, that I typically work out of on Sunday morning it, uh, says it this way, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And it's true, isn't it? The place where, where your treasure is, is the place you will most want to be and end up being. Jesus continues, your, your eyes are windows into your body. If you open your eyes wide and wonder and believe, your body fills up with light. If you live squinty-eyed in greed and distrust, there's a good word picture for us, right? If you live squinty-eyed in greed and distrust, your body is a musty cellar. If you pull the blinds on your windows, what a dark life you will have. You can't worship two gods at once. Loving one god, you'll end up hating the other. Adoration of one feeds contempt for the other. You can't worship God and money both. Well, Jesus just had to go there, didn't he? Uh, I mean, I mean, he might as well. He's already he's already talked about you know all the things uh, in our lives. He's already talked about anger and contempt and lust and the misuse of power and broken relationships and deceit and revenge and hatred and hypocrisy and and all the things. He might as well he might as well talk about um, our love affair with money. Uh, years ago. Pastor Bill Hybels wrote it, it beckons and woos us, it tantalizes and seduces us, it sucks us into its grasp and wreaks havoc in our lives, and still we deny its sinister power. A money monster? Ha! There's no such thing. Like children proud to have outgrown their belief in nocturnal bedroom threats, we laugh off the notion of a money monster, a sinister power? A tyrannizing force? You've got to be kidding. Money is simply a means of exchange. Meanwhile, he says, we devote our lives to earning it, glory in spending it, lie awake nights figuring out how to stockpile more of it. We pursue inauthentic jobs because of it. We bow at its feet and salute its command. Consider Michael, he says. A typical American child, during the most impressionable years of his life, he, he hears a steady stream of dinner conversations centered almost exclusively on money and the things it can buy. It becomes clear to him at a young age that what mom and dad really value is money. Over the next few years, the family moves several times because of promotions and salary increases. That convinces the perceptive child that monetary increases are more important than establishing stable relational or spiritual roots. Later on, the conversations turn to college and the dialogue focuses on what professions pay the most rather than what would best suit the young person's motivated abilities. The apparent message is that financial remuneration will make up for any lack of job fulfillment. He eventually enters the job market, taking the position with the highest earning potential, yet always watching for an even better opportunity. On and on it goes, each major life decision being made on the basis of the bottom line. In time, our typical American learns to equate his self-worth with his net worth, and he judges others by the same standard. 
He eventually reaches old age, totally unaware that he's been led through life on a leash by the money monster. It's a thing, isn't it? Um, I, I mean, yes, you know, in a sense, um, in a sense, it's just completely neutral. It's just a tool. It's like, it's like a screwdriver. It has a job to do, an application. It, it's simply a means of exchange. And uh, thankfully, thank God, uh, that it can be leveraged for tremendous good as a tool. It can be leveraged for tremendous good. And I'm so thankful that there are wise and godly people with money in the world who have learned to leverage it for good. And certainly there's no inherent value in poverty. I don't think any of us would argue that point. Um, you know, poverty is a plight upon humanity that we'd like to see just eliminated from the human experience. But the, but the ominous allure of money's power is a real thing. It's a real thing, and Jesus makes it plain that it can be really, really dangerous if it's allowed to get inappropriately hooked up with the human heart. Um, according to Jesus, it can easily become our God, small g, our God, the, the, one, we, the one we pursue most passionately, the, 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 one we, the one to whom we bow most readily, the the one we choose to obey most consistently. And here's the thing. Here's the thing about money. It, it makes a really great tool, but a really lousy God. It makes a really great tool, but a really lousy God. We tend to think that um, money just automatically brings with it like God, God-like gifts, <laughs> things like peace and security and contentment and happiness. But, but, the, but the truth is that all too often, and not in every scenario, but all too often it brings with it just the opposite of those things. Instead of peace, so often it brings frenzy. <laughs> You know, as we work to feverishly uh, accumulate more of it, it brings frenzy to the pace of our lives and frenzy to our minds and our hearts or as we, as we attempt to maintain the lifestyle that we've adopted because of it. <laughs> and so we just, you know, we, we get to a place where we absolutely cannot afford to take our foot off the gas. And consequently, we live at this frenzied pace. And instead of, instead of security, so often it actually breeds insecurity. As we attempt to guard ourselves against loss, as we attempt to guard ourselves against theft, and you know, what if, what if the stock market plunges? And what if the cyber thief gets through? And what if the bottom drops out? And we just live with this agonizing sense of insecurity. And instead of contentment, so often it breeds its own level of discontentment as we, as we play the comparison game because there's always somebody with more. As we, as we try to keep up with the Joneses. And perhaps you remember the, the words of the, uh, the word's first billionaire. Does anybody know who the word, world's first billionaire was? John D. Rockefeller. And one time he was asked this question, how much is enough? You know what his response was? Just a little bit more. How much is enough? Just, just a little bit more. Um, and so often instead of happiness, for some strange reason, the, the whole money thing breeds in a level of unhappiness, mostly, mostly because we really, really thought this was going to be the ticket. This was going to do the trick. And, and we forgot that happiness is primarily an inside job, not an outside job. And when it doesn't deliver, at least not for long, 
but it breeds this deep level of unhappiness. And, and so what do we do? What do we do, you know, as a, as a kingdom people? As a people desiring to live authentically under the rule and reign of Christ? Um, what, does our, what does our relationship with money need to look like here, now? Well, uh, Jesus continues. Verse 25, he says, if you, if you decide for God, living a life of God worship, it follows that you don't fuss about what's on the table at mealtimes or whether the clothes in your closet are in fashion. There's far more, Jesus says, there's far more to your life than the food you put in your stomach and more to your outer appearance than the clothes you hang on your body. And then, and then Jesus paints this kind of poetic picture for us. And, and yes, you can push some of his metaphors you know too far to where they break down but he's just picture he's just painting this poetic picture for us and he says look at the birds free and unfettered not tied down to a job description careless in their care in the care of god and then he says these words and you count far more to him than birds that's the punchline. And you count far more to him than birds. Has anyone by fussing ever, uh, excuse me, has anyone by fussing in front of the mirror ever gotten taller by so much as an inch? And I keep trying. My goal is 6'3", and I just, I just keep fussing in front of the mirror, and I just, it just doesn't seem to pan out for me that way. And so all this, all this time and money wasted on fashion, do you... Do you think it makes that much difference? Instead of looking at the fashions, walk out into the fields and look at the wildflowers. They never primp or shop. And have you ever seen color and design quite like it? The 10 best dressed men and women in, in, the, in the country look shabby alongside them. <laughs> Jesus says, if, you, if, if God gives such attention to the appearance of wildflowers, most of which are never even seen, don't you think he'll attend to you? Don't you think he'll take pride in you? Don't you think he'll do what's best for you? And then Jesus says, what I'm... What I'm trying to do here is to get you to relax. <laughs> to not be preoccupied with getting so that you can respond to God's giving. I love that so much. I, I, love, I love the mental image that comes to mind as I read those words. It's, it's the difference between living like this <laughs> and living like this do me a favor uh, would you uh, clint, well, clint, clint your fist boy this thing is popping sorry about that uh, clint, clint your fist would you come on play along just for a moment if you can clint your fist now relax feel what happens and it's the difference in what Jesus is, is teaching us, how he's teaching us to live, the difference between this and this. And he says to us, what I'm, what I'm trying to do here is to get you to relax, to not be so preoccupied with getting so that you can respond to God's giving. And what's true about us is we have a hard time receiving what God is giving when our fists are so tightly clenched and we're so preoccupied with getting. <laughs> he continues, people who don't know God and the way he works fuss over these things. But you both, you know God and how he works. <laughs> Guys, please understand, 
Please understand, Jesus is not saying don't work hard. That's not what, you know, one of the best ways to interpret the Bible is to let the Bible interpret itself, like, like read the whole of Scripture and let it, you know, comment on itself and, so that we don't go down paths of, of what it doesn't mean. <laughs> And if you read the whole of Scripture, then you know it, we're not being taught to just be sloths. You know, we're not being taught to just just buy a recliner and sit in it and don't move, and God will take care of you. That's not that's not what God is. That's not what Jesus is saying. He's not saying don't work hard. He's not saying don't be smart with your money. <laughs> He's not saying don't ever accumulate anything in life, and he's not saying don't plan for the future. He's not saying uh, don't ever wear anything, you know, stylish or trendy. He's just, he's just saying don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Choose your God, hopefully capital G, not small g. Choose your God very carefully. It's a huge decision, Jesus says. In fact, it's the biggest decision of all, both for time and for eternity. Choose your God carefully. He continues, um, steep your life in God reality, God initiative, God provisions. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. Again, the, the New International Translation, uh, it translates that verse, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. <laughs> seek first his kingdom. Seek first the rule and reign of Christ in your life and, and his righteousness and he'll take care of the other stuff, right? But I, I love this rendering from, from the message, steep your life. When I hear the word steep, I think about like a, a cup of hot tea, right? And when you, when you make a cup of hot tea, you steep the tea bag, right, for a few minutes, right? Do you do that? Any tea drinkers? You steep, isn't that what that's called? You steep, the, you steep it in the hot water for three or four minutes, you know, and let it... Uh, let it uh, do its thing. So you steep it, you saturate it. Steep your life in God reality, God initiative, God provision. Steep your life in God. Saturate your life in God. Don't worry about missing out. <laughs> um, if you have to, get off of social media so that you don't worry about missing out. <laughs> Guys, God's, God's not holding out on us. That's the oldest lie in the book. He's not holding out on us. There's so much more to life, and there's certainly so much more to eternity than fancy clothes and fancy cars and fancy houses and fancy meals and fancy vacations. And, and if you get to do a few of those things along the way, you know, if you get to take a cruise somewhere along the way, then yay, God, but... But don't make it the priority of your life. <laughs> um, invest your life, Jesus is saying. Invest your life. Invest your money. Invest your time, talent, and treasure in things that are of eternal consequence, things that matter to God. <laughs> and by the way, what matters most to God is people. Invest your life in people. Jesus uh, concludes, give your, give your entire attention to what God is doing right now and don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. David Brooks um, he wrote a book recently titled the, uh, the Second Mountain. And the mountains of which he writes are metaphorical in nature. He's not talking about real mountains. The first one, he says, is the one we, we tend to tackle early, like early in our adult years. 
as we pursue vocation, we, uh, we start to find some success, you know, along the way in our vocation. And yet it seems to be a very, very, very common human experience that conquering that first mountain so often proves to be ultimately unsatisfying. Um, Stephen Covey years ago talked, talked about it in terms of, you know, getting, getting to the top of the ladder and discovering that all this time the ladder's been leaning against the wrong wall. Uh, but fortunately, fortunately, although it's sad that it often takes this to figure it out, fortunately, our God is so gracious to us and so kind that oftentimes it's the process of summoning that first mountain getting to the peak of that first mountain that reveals the reality of the second mountain to us and it's the rea- it's the mountain um, that we were truly truly meant to climb with our lives which as brooks describes it is a mountain of faith and service and community a mountain of faith and service and community. Um, That could be a whole series in and of itself. And he talks about how climbing the second mountain involves the pursuit of what he calls eulogy virtues as opposed to resume virtues. Eulogy virtues as opposed to resume virtues. And that's an interesting thought, isn't it? Uh, In fact... uh, you're probably wondering, are we ever going to get to the whiteboard? And the good news is, yes, we are going to get to the whiteboard. So now it's uh, play along time. It's talk back to the pastor time, okay? Uh, so help me think about this just a little. I know you haven't read the book, or maybe, maybe somebody has, but um, it, just think a little bit. Help me think about eulogy virtues versus uh, resume virtues. When do you use a resume? In what context do you use a resume? In the job, or the career field, right? So uh, resume virtues. I discovered years ago if I write really sloppy up here, you can't tell if I'm spelling things correctly or not. So, um, so eulogy. When, when, do, when does a eulogy, what's the context of that? Death, right? Funeral. Um, so eulogy virtues versus resume virtue so help me just for a few minutes we won't spend a lot of time on this uh just and if you speak up please speak loudly enough for us to hear you so um resume virtues what comes to mind you know it's career oriented all those things what is it skill all right what else say that again education what else experience you guys are making it easy on me exp there you go education experience i can spell all those big words so uh what else resume virtues what's that qualifications all right specialty certifications you just said that to try to make me write all that didn't you uh, specialty certifications. There we go. Uh, that's what that spells. So, what else? Anything else? Whoa, 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 whoa. Fancy titles. All right. Like specialty certifications. Uh, uh, fancy titles. All right. Let's, uh, let's jump over here. We're about out of space. Eulogy virtues. What comes to mind? Salvation. Okay. What else? Salvation, values, what else? Family, what'd you say? Family, yeah. What else? Reputation, compassion. Community involvement. Helping others. All right, we're out of space. So, um, but you get the picture, right? Um, 
resume virtues, what it takes to climb the ladder of success, what it takes to achieve in the corporate world or whatever it might be, whatever, versus eulogy virtues. This is basically is thinking about uh, what kind of person am I? <laughs> what are they going to say about me when I'm dead and gone? Are they just going to recite all my resume virtues? Or is there going to be something... Um, meaningful in terms of my person, my character. I, I, can't, I can't help but think that maybe, maybe that's kind of what Jesus is driving at here also. And I know he's talking about money, but, but I think he's kind of driving at this whole thing of eulogy virtues as opposed to simply just resume virtues. Uh, but but not, not just so that people will say good things about us at our funeral. <laughs> but so that our lives really count for something. Th- that our lives uh, count uh, for something bigger than us. That our, that our lives count for something you know, bigger than just the present moment. <laughs> yeah, uh, even, and by count for something, let's be careful with that. Because even if the world doesn't see it as significant or meaningful... The world's approval is not the one we're looking for, right? (laughs) Um, And to to live for, to invest in something bigger, something better, something grander, maybe even something eternal. (laughs) And so Jesus says, what I'm trying to do here is to get you to relax. (laughs) I love that. To not be so preoccupied with the first mountain. (laughs) To not be so preoccupied with getting, (laughs) with achieving, with making your mark in the world, making sure they know you're somebody, with accumulating stuff, (laughs) so that you can respond to God's giving. (laughs) Steep your life saturate your life in God reality God initiative God provisions don't worry about missing out give your entire attention to what God is doing right now and don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. I'm going to invite the band to come. We're going to wrap this up. I'm not quite done, so as they're coming, then continue to listen, all right, just for a moment. I titled this message this morning, um, The Biggest Decision of All. That's quite a title, isn't it? Pretty bold and claim but the truth is it really is it really is I'm not even exaggerating not not even a little bit and actually actually there are a couple there are a couple like biggest decisions of all that are looming here the first one is this and this is the the biggest decision of all and that is who Or what will you choose as your God? Small g or big g. Who or what will you choose as your God? That's, there aren't any bigger decisions than that. And that's what Jesus is inviting us to consider here. Who or what will you choose as your God? And the second one is this. Which mountain will you spend your life's time and energy on? The mountain of resume virtues or the mountain of eulogy virtues? You know, investing in things that really matter according to God. Maybe there are even things that are just completely hidden Maybe they're things that nobody will ever notice or give you accolades for, but 
but in the sight of God. Things that really matter. Jesus called it laying up treasures in heaven. So who or what will you choose as your God? Which mountain will you spend your life's time and energy and resources on? Thank you.